60 Minutes, Rewind. The Abscam trials have resulted in the conviction of six congressmen, one mayor, and sundry others, and more indictments are expected. And currently, the senior senator from New Jersey, Harrison Williams, is facing a jury on nine Abscam charges, including one for bribery. The chief witness in all of this courtroom action is the Stingman, Mel Weinberg, who has collaborated on a book just published by that title. It was Weinberg who conceived the idea of Abscam, wrote its scenario, and personally handled almost every approach made to those public officials. It was he who convinced the FBI to set him up as the business representative of a mythical Arab sheik who wanted to invest his millions in the United States. The sheik would be willing to pay the congressman generously, said Weinberg, if they could in return guarantee him permanent residence in this country. For using Weinberg, the FBI has come under fire. A defense attorney called him a one-man crime wave. Another said he makes J.R. of Dallas look like Peter Pan. Abscam, the entire enterprise, Bill, was conceived and executed by the FBI, staged by the FBI. That's correct. And a confessed swindler, Mel Weinberg. You. That's correct. Don't you see the difference between the FBI, the government, investigating a crime that has already been committed and inventing a scenario for crime, inventing and staging abscam? Well, Mike, let me ask you a question. How would you catch him? You set a crook to catch a crook, all right? We put the, the big honey pot out there and all the flies came to us. You don't think you're going to walk up to a Congress and say, I want to bribe you. You have to give them a reason why you want to bribe. What can he do for you? Every one of these congressmen were told one thing only. If you can do us a favor for these Arabs, all right, that you'll sponsor them, we're willing to pay. If you can't do it, then we don't want to pay you. You've said, I'm going to be delighted to let the people of this country know what their politicians are really like. That's correct. What are the politicians really like? Well, I personally think they're a bunch of perverts, drunks, and crooks. Well, conceivably, it takes one to know one now, but... That's true. No argument with that. I'm not a pervert. I may be a crook. Uh-huh. And I'm not a drunk. Prior to Abscam, Weinberg was an international confidence man and hustler, fleecing the unsuspecting to make his living through a phony company he called London Investors. What was your average annual income for the five years, let's say, prior to Abscam? Oh, I would say I, I must average, the company I had must average a half a million to a million a year or more. This is London Investors? That's correct. And your deal basically was getting front money from people that you were going to deliver loans to, except you never delivered the loans. That's correct. And you mean to say that year after year, though you didn't deliver loans, though you were swindling people, no harm came to you, nobody, nobody tried to take you out nobody oh yeah i was uh, one time i dealt with an attorney down in miami who was related to a guy uh i forgot his name tony something i didn't know who he was uh, i took this attorney and uh his uncle came up i wanted to throw me out the window and uh i stopped mentioning names of people i knew and i was hoping i get the right name i couldn't back down and say i swindled him and he would have thrown me out i had to keep bluffing my way through and I had one foot through the window. I was fighting like mad. You serious? Oh, yeah. And uh, I must have hit the right name because he, they held up and they just threatened me. But you mean to say, Mel, that in, let's say, those five years, you must have swindled, I don't know, what, a thousand, five thousand people? Oh, we used to have it sometimes a hundred people a month. And a lot of people we took a second time. Told we were going to put them with another bank. And, then, and you'd get another front, get upfront it, payment? Right. People and, are damn fools, aren't they? Oh, yeah. People, they want to be taken. I mean, uh, if you have the, the, as we call the fruit salad, to give to them, all right, uh, we had the limousine. What you're saying is the fruit salad includes a limousine to impress your Fancy potential Fancy offers, mark. the telex, uh, the phone ringing all the time. How do you keep the phone ringing all the time? A lot of people call up and know where their money was. <laughs> have you ever been swindled yourself? Oh, yeah, lots of times. You have? Oh, yeah. I mean, every kind may get swindled. I mean, that's standard. Tell me once. I uh, went the Yaki Indians. I went down there to buy gold. I bought a contract, which I should have known was, wasn't was right, because where the hell would they get a typewriter to type on? You mean they, they give you a typed contract? Oh, the contract with Rivers was beautiful. Yaki Indians where? In New Mexico, right off the Arizona border there. How much did they take you for? Oh, I don't remember offhand. About five, ten grand. 
But it actually didn't take me. I got copies of the contract, and on the way back to the West Coast, I sold about 30 of them at 1,000 apiece. So I came out ahead. One time, his swindle didn't work, and he was arrested by the FBI. As part of the deal he worked out, Weinberg agreed to work undercover on four cases in order to keep himself and an associate out of jail. Those cases were completed prior to Abscam, but Weinberg continued working for the FBI. Mel Weinberg, why did you cooperate with the FBI? Help the FBI to stage Abscam? Was it, was it fear? Was it patriotism? Or was it just another way to make a buck? Strictly for the money. I went in and started with them. I have a government exhibit here that says that from March 2nd, 1978 through December of 1980, they paid you in excess of $150,000. Right, but a lot of that is expensive if you look at it. See the, the uh, All right, all right. Taxpayer's money, $150,000. Did the taxpayer get his money's worth? Oh, I believe so. How? They got the six congressmen plus a, a, a senator. Uh, they got a, a mayor. They got a state senator, and plus a, a, a lot of other small type people, the cases are coming up. It seems that Angelo Eracetti, who was the mayor of Camden, New Jersey, was the first political target, right? He was, the f uh, he was actually the first political person we met. When you met Eracetti, what did you figure about him? I liked him. You liked Eracetti? Oh yeah, I think if I had met Eracetti, if I say, Five, six years ago, we were some partners. I mean, he was, he was something else. He was terrific. Why? What, what, uh... He would get into any crooked deal you want. He would bring up some real crazy deals to us. I mean, he wanted to get into counterfeit money. Uh, he wanted to give us the port of Canada for narcotics. Uh, anything that was dishonest, he wanted to do. I mean, <laughs> he was a likable guy. I mean, out of all the people that we dealt with, he was the most likable one now. What makes him likable? Well, you know where he was coming from. I mean, he wouldn't hedge. He wasn't a cryer. He'd come out and tell you exactly what it was. I mean, he wouldn't beat around the bush. He'd tell you he wanted this. He wanted to make money. One time, uh, we were in the Hotel Hilton, and the mayor came up ahead of time before the equipment was set up. What Hilton? The Hilton Hotel by Kennedy Airport. Yeah. And he came up to the room, the suite of rooms we had before the equipment was set up. Mayor Arachetti. came in the room, he's talking to me and another agent, and there's a knock on the door, and he opens the door, and there's the guy, who's the FBI agent, with all the equipment. So the guy looked at the, uh, the mayor, and he shit. I mean, he, <laughs> he didn't know what to say. So the mayor said, what say? He said, shooting a TV commercial down the hall. What am I going to tell him? They're sitting with all the equipment in their hand. And he never said a word. Mayor Arachetti, your mark. Yeah. Smart fellow. Well, these things happen, and he believed in us so much that he didn't take any notice. Uh, and he was, in effect, the Judas goat of Abscan. He was the fellow, the mark, that led many of the other political figures to the slaughter. That's right. Arachetti brought you to Howard Crichton. Right. And Howard Crichton was the middleman who set things right. up. Characterize the various congressmen convicted in Abscan. Who was the smartest? Murphy. John Murphy, Murphy of New York. Extremely intelligent fellow. Uh, Murphy was suspicious. He would never talk money. Very careful what he said. He thought every word what he said. Uh, when we had the meeting there, when we were dividing up the, the shares for the shipping company we were going to buy, and I said, what's your share? He says, I don't want none, but he winked. Unfortunately, wink didn't come out on TV. I mean, he didn't know he was going to wink, otherwise we'll put the camera on his eyes. The two easiest ones was Ozzy Myers and Raymond Letter. I mean, they came in, Ozzy Myers gave his speech, you know, he, you know, bullshit walks, money talks, uh, you, you're buying me, and in fact, you couldn't even shut him up, and he kept going, he wasn't going to leave that room without that money, and he picked the money up himself and took off. Uh, Letterer, Raymond Letterer came in, and he, his big speech was, I'm no Boy Scout, and he picked the money, and well, he was nervous, because when he went out of the hotel room, he went left instead of right, and I had to show him where the uh, elevator was. He was nervous. And the other reason he won, the dumbest, well, you could say, is Kelly. The fellow from Florida. Yeah, the one that stuffed the money in his pockets. I mean, his thing was, if you knew how poor I was, you'd cry for me. Uh, he was pretty poor. I mean, I mean, you know, he actually was putting it in his pockets, and then after the, when he finally realized he was caught, he gave that great speech on TV that he was doing his own investigation. I mean, I could have thought of a better excuse than that. Frank Thompson uh, is an old-time pro, all right, as a congressman. Uh, 
like all Congress, he talks, but he double talks. He says nothing. There is a very definite extent to which I or any other friendly member of Congress can help them. But it's very difficult. Very difficult. Well, that's what the money is for, is to, <coughs> is to you know, keep this yeah, well, I'm not for any money. All right, hold it right there. I'm not looking for any money. This Congressman Frank Thompson saying, I'm not looking for any money. Okay, you say, oh. so long, Congressman. You're an honest man, and you walk out. But if he was an honest Congressman, what the man should have done, because we mentioned money to him, was got up, walked out, and turned us in. He didn't get up and walk out. He sit there and listen to the rest of the spiel. After the Congressman had left, Mel Weinberg on the left, Howard Crichton, the middleman who brought Congressman Frank Thompson in on the right, and FBI agent Tony Amoroso in the middle laid out their strategy for getting Frank Thompson to accept the payoff. I don't mind handing you 50000 but I want to know from this man that he's getting 50000 he's getting something. He f***ing says to me, oh, I don't want any money. Well, I'll tell you what, if he thinks the whole f***ing place is bugged and everybody's going to be running around here and, and he's not telling me that he's going to get the money, I don't mind giving it to you. If he tells me, okay, fine. How am I going to do that? The last time we did business with the other two guys, we discussed it. it was, I gave it to the f***ing guy. He carried it out. All right? You said you had the same problem with the guy this afternoon. I'm going to have the same problem with Scratcher. Well, what? Well, then how come the two, first two guys, everything was... It was a different ball game with those. This guy is such a f***ing... This guy's got 25 years seniority, for Christ's sake. Well, I'm giving him $2,000 a year for seniority. He's got to tell me something. Here's the money. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't dispute you. All right, please don't. But don't put me into that kind of spot. I, I'm committed to this man and to his manager. All right, stop the tape. Mel, you're browbeating Howard Crichton. You're trying to get his man in the, to come in and take the money. If that isn't entrapment, if that isn't browbeating a witness, so to speak, in order to get him to commit a crime to your order, no. So that you fellows will look good, so that you'll get what you're after, which is the commission of a crime on camera with the congressman taking the money. I don't know what it is. That's not true. So you got to understand, Crichton knew the ground rules before he brought the guy. Crichton was playing, trying to play cute with us. But you don't know that the congressman knew that. Oh, he wouldn't have been there if he didn't know. What did he come there for, to have a drink? When he came back the second time, and if you looked at the tape, there was a tug of war. Who was going to take the case between him and Crichton? Tony had the toughest job. He had to make the decision to give him the money or not to give him. Tony Amoroso. Correct. Now, if he gave him the money and he did wrong, it was his neck. If he didn't give him the money, it was his neck. And he was under a lot of pressure. Me and Tony were very relaxed. We were not a nervous type. We met the congressman. Half the time we weren't dressed. I didn't have socks on my feet. We were playing poker all day, waiting for him to come. And when they walked in, they must have looked at us like we didn't look like businessmen half the time. There's nothing greater, you know, you take these politicians, they come in there and they sprout how good they are, how powerful they are, and you're sitting back laughing, they think you're stupid, and you're sitting laughing, you'll get yours. It's a pretty story. The whole thing. The whole thing is the truth. I have no problem understanding they've been coming at me to catch me in a lie. They haven't caught me in one yet, because I have no problem. All I do is tell the truth. Is your slate now wiped clean for what you've done with the Yes, FBI? yes. No one can get you for nothing. No one can touch me for anything. I don't do anything wrong now. I became a holy roller. I find it difficult to understand how the congressmen were as, in effect, easy. They weren't easy. We were just good. 